Great. Um, so I'd like to thank, uh, first of all, Arwa for inviting me um, to give this lecture today and specifically to Arwa Hobori for um, organizing the bioarchaeology lecture, uh, lecture series. Um, so today I, I'm very pleased to be able to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that I've been doing over the past couple years um, as part of my PhD, uh, which I completed um, at the beginning of this year at the University of Connecticut. Um, I'm now a postdoc at uh, Gotha University in Frankfurt, um, where I'm going to be uh, investigating similar questions, uh, but for the Bronze Age in Oman. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, fuel use and the way that archaeobotanists uh, and environmental archaeologists like myself um, can uh, use fuel remnants in order to explore the nature of human environmental relationships, early resource use, um, and, and fuel economies in the past. Um, so I think the first question before we um, get too far into this, hold on. I'm having a little trouble, here we go. Um, before we uh, uh, get into uh, a couple case studies that I have from the sites of Tel Zedan and Surasia, located in Northern Mesopotamia, is to ask the question, why study fuel at all? Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, fuel use and fuel economies um, are somewhat maybe neglected topic, not intentionally, uh, in any way um, within archaeology as a whole, um, particularly within the archaeology of Mesopotamia. Um, but understanding fuel use, I think, is a, a really quite important thing for us to consider um, because it, it is an essential practice, a, a daily practice that, that most people in the past and even today have to contend with, right? We're talking about heating homes, um, uh, creating light, cooking food, um, and oftentimes uh, removing waste or, or reusing waste products in a productive way. It also can allow us to talk about changes in craft technologies, um, particularly in the time periods that I'm interested in, the Calcolithic and Bronze Age. Um, there are important innovations occurring in, uh, in craft and pyrotechnologies. So understanding changes in fuel economies can give us greater insight into, into these technological developments as well. Um, and then finally, uh, because prior to the industrial re re revolutions, most people relied on biomass fuel resources like wood or animal dung, um, studying fuel can really give us uh, an, some insight into human environment relationships and how people are extracting um, plant material or, or biomass in general from the environment uh, and the sort of changes that can eventually occur in the environment because of that. So the, for example, the intensification of fuel use um, over time can lead to progressive deforestation and environmental damage. Now, I'm certainly not the first person to consider uh, the impact of fuels or energy um, when uh, examining people in the past. Early approaches have uh, often focused on energetics as a, a means of understanding so-called cultural evolution. You can think of the work of Leslie White back in the 40s and 50s. Um, but this perspective even continues today um, with, with uh, the, the fields of human uh, energetics and, and looking at um, the notion that changing um, energy requirements affect technological change and, and social change. Um, from an archeological and specifically archeobotanical perspective, um, recently there's been a, a, a sort of uh, explosion in research uh, globally in, in, into fuel um, and specifically into trying to place fuel as um, a specific object or topic of study within archaeology in its own right, much like we might think of the archaeology of uh, food or the archaeology of uh, households, right? The idea is that this important and, and, and basic need that humans has deserves um, uh, a, a central place in the way we investigate the past. Um, 
Within Southwest Asia, broadly, and, and, and Northern Mesopotamia in particular, there have been several published papers recently investigating um, the role of fuels um, and the potential applications of fuel studies to better understand uh, this region um, in the past. So I want to move on uh, to just talk about a couple of ways um, that archaeobotanists in particular can examine um, the archaeological record to find information about fuel. And I'm going to focus um, uh, in this discussion largely on, on direct approaches to studying fuel remnants, right? So the remains of uh, past fuel burning activities. There's of course a variety of different other um, techniques like ethnoarchaeology, experimental studies, textual analysis, things like that, that can provide you uh, really interesting information on fuel. But for our purposes, I wanna focus on the, the, um, the material remnants that we find of fuel itself. Um, so I'm gonna come back to this, uh, um, this figure in a minute, um, but the main three uh, types of data uh, that an archaeobotanist might use to investigate fuel use in the past, and, and it's what I'm going to use in, this, uh, in the case studies to follow uh, to talk about calcolithic fuel use, um, are macrobotanical, non-woody macrobotanical remains like seeds um, and different uh, vegetative plant parts, um, wood charcoal, obviously wood is a, a, an important fuel globally. Um, so looking at um, wood charcoal uh, preserved in the archeological record can give us a lot of different insights um, into past fuel use and fuel selection. Um, and uh, geoarcheological approaches, which can be paired with archaeobotanical analyses to really enhance their interpretive value. Um, and specifically through the analysis of things like dung spherulites and ash pseudomorphs, which are both uh, calcitic remnants of, of burning uh, preserved in ash. Um, so wood charcoal analysis or the, the, the field of anthropology um, relies mostly on the taxonomic identification of wood charcoal um, using uh, the anatomy of preserved pieces of wood to um, investigate changes in vegetation over time um, or to uh, identify types of fuel. Um, anthropologists have spent a long time developing really very rigorous methods of um, of analyzing this sort of data and pay particular attention to the types of deposits in which it's derived from in order to uh, be able to um, say with confidence whether the information we're getting is coming from uh, what vegetation, what trees are available to people in the past in the environment, or if they're choosing specific trees for particular behaviors. Um, and this is primarily done by looking at long-term deposits, things like refuse pits, middens, fill, versus short-term deposit, hards, ovens, kilns, etc. But anthropologists can take this data even further um, by looking at uh, specific anatomical features or the presence of information within individual fragments of wood charcoal in order to glean more information and often information about wood management strategies. So you can look at several different things like um, you can look at the ring curvature to degree to and estimate at what, you know, where in a branch uh, a fragment of wood came from or what size that branch is. Um, you can look for evidence of, say, the presence of bark, right, or the presence of fungal hyphae. Fungal hyphae might suggest that the, the wood in question uh, had rotted prior to use, um, so it allows you to talk about whether green wood or, or um, rotten fallen branches uh, were being used. And then finally, you can look at uh, the spacing between different rings, right? We all know um, uh, the field of dendrochronology, right, which uses the spaces between rings in order to count years back and give us quite accurate dates. 
If we're looking at uh, macro botanical remains, such as seeds and non-woody plant parts, the, the, the picture becomes a little bit more complicated. Now, traditionally, this data set has been used largely to discuss questions on foodways uh, and crop production, um, examining, for, exa for example, the uh, domestication of crops and their spread throughout the world. Um, but being primarily preserved through carbonization, they also record information about fire, um, and especially if they were used in part as fuel. Um, Naomi Miller in the 1980s recognized that at least within Southwest Asia and other areas where pastoralism was quite important and the environment was uh, quite dry and often uh, had limited access to trees, um, that people regularly burned dung fuel um, it makes an excellent fuel source uh, and that many of the carbonized seeds we see in the ar archaeological record are likely in fact derived from fuel use activities rather than necessarily um, uh, uh, questions of foodways or agronomy. Now recently uh, after that, uh, there's been much debate within the field of, uh, uh, of archaeobotany about how best to interpret these seeds. When is it done? When is it um, crop processing or consumption information? Um, and um, and, and uh, I, I call uh, co-authored a, a, a paper uh, with my doctoral advisor, Alexia Smith, uh, several years ago, where we argued that um, it depends on the research, researcher's interpretation and the other info, information uh, available to them on whether or not a data set is going to be interpreted as fuel or, or food. Um, and this uh, can be really the, the same data, right? The same counts of the same tax. It can be interpreted in two very different ways depending on what you believe about the formation processes of, uh, of that particular assemblage. Um, so it becomes necessary to be able to um, tease apart that information. It's really a question of equifinality, right? You need more information uh, in order to uh, be able to know for sure whether uh, something might represent uh, the remnants of crop processing or dung fuel, or perhaps the remnants of both, maybe they were mixed or there's foddering involved, something like that. Um, so in order to do that, uh, recently several archaeobotanists have been, uh, have begun to borrow uh, some established techniques from geoarchaeology in order to try to um, more um, directly confirm the presence of dung and then link it um, to the archaeobotanical assemblage. So uh, geoarchaeologists have identified um, these small calcetic dung spherulites, which are small crystals of calcite that form in the guts of animals um, and get deposited in dung. And these preserve archaeologically uh, within deposits where dung once was. Furthermore, um, more recent work uh, by Ger Arya has explored the the possibility of using these in conjunction with other uh, microscopic remnants of ash, um, specifically calcitic ash pseudomorphs of calcium oxalate, as a way of uh, determining whether a given context is dung-derived or wood-derived, specifically pyrotechnic contexts or, or hards. Um, so we can use this information in conjunction with the archaeobotanical data, which gives you this really rich ecological data set, um, to really start to say uh, a little bit more about fuel selection practices and fuel preferences and the environment uh, beyond were they, you know, um, were they using wood versus dung fuels. Um, so this brings me now to the uh, case studies. Um, that I'm going to be discussing um, from northern Mesopotamia. Um, and I just want to go through a couple research questions that are driving this research specifically into, into the Calcolithic. Um, so at first, I'm interested in ident identifying what fuel remnants we can find at these sites. Can, what can we identify as fuel versus non-fuel? Um, 
Are there differences present between different uh, context phases and, and between the sites? If so, could these patterns be related to the overall availability of fuel, of wood fuels in the environment, right? So uh, it, it depends on what they have access to uh, in the past. And if there are changes in the environment, either human driven or, or, or climate driven, do those change uh, what fuels are available and used? But also, um, can we explain patterning and fuel use based on its potential function? Are there certain burning qualities or certain qualities uh, that make it uh, easier to collect, um, which might be structuring the patterning of fuel uh, within these sites? And then finally, um, what can we talk about in terms of evidence for management of fuel sources? Can we really think uh, at, at this time about a fuel, a specific fuel economy? Are people making deliberate choices about the resources they have access to? So in order to do this, um, I'm going to present some uh, data that I've collected from two sites, Tel Zedan and Surasia, which are located in Northern Mesopotamia. And primarily uh, the, from the context I'm looking at, date to the Ubaid, in the late Calcolithic one phases. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the, the history of Mesopotamia, but if there's anybody who works outside that region, I just wanna give a real rough overview um, of both the region and, and the time periods in question to sort of make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so Mesopotamia is the um, land located within and between the Tigris and Euphrates watersheds. Um, when we tr traditionally think of Mesopotamia, we think of southern Mesopotamia, which is the marshlands of southern Iraq. Um, and this area is particularly important uh, uh, for having been the origins of urban societies uh, at the end of the late Calcolithic. Now, over the last 30 years, a considerable amount of research uh, has been done in northern Mesopotamia. Um, which is what is also called the Fertile Crescent, the tip of the Fertile Crescent. Um, and research over this time has actually found that, in fact, this region is contemporary with Southern Mesopotamia, many of these developments towards complexity and later on urbanism. So the sites of Tel Zedan and Surasia um, actually come before the emergence of the first uh, urban settlements in northern Mesopotamia during the um, Calcolithic era. Um, and specifically, they were occupied uh, primarily during what's called the Ubaid period uh, from about uh, the mid 6th century to the mid 5th century BC. Um, and then the LC1 period, which is the sort of transitionary period between the Ubaid um, and the later LC3 and LC, LC3 through LC5 periods. Um, now, this is just sort of a really broad overview, um, but these periods are important in uh, showing some really interesting uh, uh, developments in social complexity. Um, you see some of the first. All right, um, so yes, just to sort of summarize here um, that I'm primarily talking about the Ubaid and LC1 periods at both sites. Um, so just to briefly talk about what we already know about fuel in Northern Mesopotamia um, through uh, textual accounts, ethnographic uh, studies, ethnoarchaeological uh, studies and prior uh, archaeobotanical work, um, we know that there's a variety of biomass fuels available to people in, in northern Mesopotamia. This includes firewood, but also uh, prepared charcoal. Uh, it will, would include animal dung cakes, uh, straw and other types of agricultural waste, reeds, fruit stones, and oil pressings, um, and other things. Um, in southern Mesopotamia, um, you know, there's quite a bit of abundant oil and bitumen. Um, so far, I don't think there's really any evidence to suggest that people were using um, 
um, oil or petroleum products or petroleum de derivatives uh, as fuel in any sort of way. We're mostly just talking about these biomass uh, fuel resources. Um, and there have been a number of different uh, studies on um, components of fuel use uh, in northern Mesopotamia. These have largely focused on the uh, Bronze Age, um, in particular the early Bronze Age, uh, but, but also into the, the Middle and Late Bronze Age and Early Iron Age. Um, some notable ones, um, work by Kathleen Deckers, um, has used wood charcoal uh, from a number of different sites across uh, uh, the Jazeera um, in order to track vegetation development uh, in the region has identified um, the uh, slow degradation of woodlands over time during the Bronze Age, uh, potentially in response to widespread urbanization. Um, from, a, from the other uh, side of things, um, Miller and Marston published a paper uh, in uh, 2012 uh, when they, where they looked at evidence for dung fuel and agropastoralism and tracked um, these uh, along the upper Euphrates Valley uh, and found a, a link between, or what they argued to be a link between precipitation gradients and the use of fuel. So as you traveled south into the more arid regions, they found a greater proportion of seed to wood charcoal. And they looked at the ratio of seed to ch wood charcoal, which they interpreted as evidence uh, for increased dung fuel usage and increased reliance on pastoralism in the so-called zone of uncertainty uh, where agricultural production uh, becomes quite risky. Um, so I just want to give you sort of an idea uh, uh, of the environment. Um, so here you have two images from um, uh, from two years ago before the pandemic uh, from the Erbil Plain in Iraqi Kurdistan um, near to the site of Zurasia. Um, the Erbil Plain is an incredibly productive agricultural region. So these photos don't quite do it justice because they were taken in August uh, when everything's dried out, but uh, it, it, it's an important agricultural region. And so um, is widespread fields across the plain, very few trees today. Um, and then the hill surrounding it is a really heavily degraded uh, step, um, degraded through thousands of years of agro-pastoral uh, production, both on and, and surrounding the plain. Um, we can imagine in the past um, that there may have been a, a sort of a, a parkland mosaic uh, of trees um, on this step uh, cut by rivers and wadis uh, with gallery forests surrounding them. For Tel Zaydan, which is located in a, in a more arid area uh, than, than Surasia, um, you might imagine a, a dry scrubby step uh, surrounded by a gallery forest similar uh, to what you see uh, in this image uh, surrounding the Euphrates and Balik rivers, uh, which the site lies right next to. Um, so uh, paleoecologists uh, and archaeobotanists have been trying to reconstruct uh, the environment uh, in northern Mesopotamia for quite a long time. So I've constructed this, uh, this map, um, which shows sort of a hypothetical potential maximum vegetation. If you took out um, all uh, human impacts, what uh, might the vegetation look like in Northern Mesopotamia? And you see the, uh, the rainfall gradient from North to South decreases. Um, and along that, a transition from oak woodlands uh, in the mountains of the Taurus and Zagros mountains, um, all the way down to uh, sort of scrubland and open uh, xerophilic shrubs uh, when you get to the Syrian desert. Cutting through this are the Tigris River and Euphrates River valleys, where again you'd find that riparian zone surrounding the site uh, with trees. 
So at this point, then I just want to uh, break into a, a quick um, description of the two sites uh, and the archaeology uh, and, and, and phasing of, of where I'm uh, drawing the samples that I worked on from. Um, so first is uh, the site of Tel Zedan. Like I said, it's located um, at the point where the Balik and Euphrates valleys meet. I can go back here to this map real quick. Um, right where they meet um, close to the modern city of Raqqa. The site is uh, about 12.5 hectares in size uh, and was excavated between 2008 and 2010 uh, by a team from the University of Chicago headed by Dr. Gil Stein. Um, the site represents one of the largest Ubayid period uh, um, uh, tells in all of Northern Mesopotamia, at least that has been uh, excavated um, and is notable for wide expanses of easily accessible Ubayid and LC1 uh, architecture. Now, I'm gonna focus on a couple areas of excavation. You can see a map of the, uh, of the excavations and geophysical surveys uh, from Tel Zedan here. We're gonna talk about two areas in particular. The first uh, is Operations 11 and 14. Um, these contained an Ubayid period domestic structure is probably a, a large, maybe multi-family domestic structure. Uh, filled with rooms, with uh, hards, with ovens, and with pits cut throughout. On the other side of the mound is Operation 8. And within Operation 8, uh, a, a large number of uh, preserved pyrotechnic features, which appear to be pottery kilns, uh, were found. And this seems to represent uh, almost a specialized area for pottery production on the site. And then finally, um, I will uh, also be including a little bit of data from Operation 10, which primarily dates to the LC1 period uh, and was mostly uh, a pit fill uh, and, 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 and with some isolated architecture in between. Now, um, just to keep in mind when I'm going through the data, the, 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 the sample counts really favor the Ubayid period uh, at Tel Zedan. So most of what we'll be talking about is the Ubayid period in Ops 11 and 14 and Operation 18, or in Operation 8. Now, um, there's been considerable uh, prior work on the archaeobotany at Tel Zedan, Tel Zedan um, undertaken uh, initially uh, by my doctoral advisor, Alexia Smith. Um, we recently published a paper in 2019 that specifically looked at the question of identifying fuel sources uh, from Tel Zedan uh, using this combination of spherulites and macrobotanical data. Um, and we were able to find several, situa uh, several distinct contexts um, in which there were elevated counts of uh, dung spherulites. These uh, correlated well uh, with the, the, the type of taxa that were coming out of these sites or out of these contexts, um, but it didn't include much information on wood charcoal. So um, part of what I, uh, I've been working on is analyzing the wood charcoal uh, from Tel Zedan and integrating it into this existing data set of macrobotanical and dung spherulite. Um, data. So this brings me to the second site um, in, in, that I'm, I'm looking at, and this is the site of Surasia. Surasia is located, like I said, on the Erbil Plain. It's a, a it contains a approximately 2.8 hectare uh, uh, mound surrounded by a, a larger lower town that dates primarily to later time periods. The site is located just south of the modern city of Erbil um, on the plain uh, with um, the nearest water course uh, at least uh, a kilometer away and it's a small uh, seasonal stream. 
Excavations at this site were also conducted by the same University of uh, Chicago excavation team, which was really uh, fantastic for me, right? Because you know the, the methods of ex excavation and the recording systems are all the same. It allows for a great deal of comparability between these two sites and makes for a really ideal um, situation. Um, so excavations to date at this site have focused on area B, which you can see in the foreground here. Um, area B consists of three separate trenches um, from right to left is two, nine, and 10. Operations two and nine contain uh, well stratified uh, domestic structures, which were rebuilt over time from the late Ubayid period all the way into uh, the LC1 and uh, potentially into the LC1 slash two as well. So for my discussion of this site, I'm gonna primarily focus on uh, these areas. Um, the rest of the excavations contain pits from later time periods dating to the LC1 two, uh, but also storage pits from the late bronze age. Um, and then finally, uh, in the last couple seasons that we were there, we were able to uh, really start to um, uh, define this large non-domestic structure straddling operations nine and 10. Um, but uh, the analysis of the archaeobotanical remains from, from these parts of the um, site are still ongoing. So I'm not gonna really talk about those today. So we're really gonna focus on the Ubayid um, and LC1 uh, domestic context from this site. Um, and like Tel Zaydan, there's a little bit of bias um, in, in the sample counts. Um, at Serasia, it favors more of the LC1 uh, than the uh, Ubayid period. Um, so just to keep that in mind when we're comparing the two sites that, that the data is a lot more robust for the different time periods. All right, and then in terms of methods that I used, I sampled uh, flotation samples from uh, all primary and secondary contexts uh, from uh, these sites. Um, and prior to uh, floating them, removed a small subsample in order to do the geoarchaeological components of this analysis. Um, so altogether for both sites, we have the macro botanical data, the wood charcoal information, uh, and the analyses of dung spherulites and ash pseudomorphs. So let's talk about some results. Um, we'll focus first on the macrobotanical remains from the sites. Um, you can see here uh, a graph showing the proportion of um, major types of remains um, from the two sites. Um, the agricultural crops uh, found within uh, both sites are broadly similar. They, they seem to have a, a, a similar agricultural basis uh, that is um, quite common. It's been identified at other Ubayid uh, and early late Chalcolithic sites uh, throughout the region, which is a focus uh, really heavily on barley and emmer wheat, um, supplemented with various legumes like lentils, um, and then smaller quantities of uh, oil crops, such as flax. So if you look at the results um, here, I think you, there, you see some pretty obvious differences between sites, but I think the, uh, the trends within, uh, between time periods at the sites are a little bit more ambiguous. So at Surasia, uh, much of the uh, remains, the seeds uh, encountered at the site uh, come from wild or weedy taxa, taxa you might uh, expect to find um, on the steppe or as field weeds, uh, but not economic taxa, right? Um, and then you have smaller quantities of uh, processing debris that's in the yellow there um, from the site and then cereal grains. At Tel Zaydan, um, there's really an enormous amount of uh, cereal chaff, of, and especially of late stage processing debris like spikelet forks and gloom bases from Emmer wheat. Um, oftentimes from these um, samples, you'd have several hundred to a thousand uh, of these uh, spikelet fork fragments per sample. So there's really 
really an assemblage dominated by this crop processing waste, um, which leads to the question, what, what's going on here? Is, are they using waste for fuel or is this simply a disposal of, of the crop processing, processing waste? Um, if we look instead uh, at this data set um, from a contextual perspective, um, again, we don't really see so much uh, in the way of differences at, at the intra-site level, but between sites, there is again that, that striking difference between a really weedy, wild dominated assemblage at Serasia and one that's really focused on, um, on cereal chaff at Tel Zedan. We can view this in another way uh, if we use uh, a, a what's called a ternary chart, uh, which compares the proportions of economic cro crops, wild and weedy um, um, taxa, uh, and cereal chaff uh, at a sample by sample basis. So you have here in blue samples from Tel Zedan and in black uh, samples from Surasia, um, and then they are, they are marked by which period they're in. And I think this presents a really clear picture of how the Tel Zedan is a chaff, uh, uh, chaff dominated assemblage while uh, Surasia is very much a wild and weedy dominated assemblage. And just keep this in mind when we get back to the geoarchaeological data and what we're seeing um, in terms of dung spherulites. But before we do that, let's turn um, and talk about the wood charcoal, um, which gives us, I think, some really interesting uh, information both within um, site and between sites on fuel use specifically. Um, so the first thing I just want to point out is that there's a massive difference in the amount of wood recovered between the two sites. Only about 100 fragments were found from Telsurasia. Um, they were really um, quite poorly preserved as well. You know, almost, uh, almost a quarter of them were uh, indeterminate, could only be uh, described as angiosperms. Um, and there's a, a fair percentage of just completely unidentifiable fragments as well. Um, so the, the quality of the, this, uh, the, of the wood charcoal data from Surasia is not great. Um, it seems to be quite poorly preserved. The situation is quite different at Tel Zedan, where we were able to, cons uh, able to uh, recover a, a, a much larger assemblage of wood charcoal uh, with over 615 uh, fragments um, greater than four millimeters in size, which is um, the, the, the size category at which I use to identify them. Um, and when we look at the Tel Zedan assemblage at the, as a whole, it's really uh, dominated by two types of um, riparian taxa. Uh, tamarisk uh, makes up over 75% of the assemblage. Um, and then um, poplar or willow, it's, it's not really possible um, or not easy, I should say, to uh, distinguish the two archibotanically, um, but uh, poplar or willow makes up a, a smaller percentage uh, of the Zedan data set. Right. At Zerasia, what you see uh, is a mix between these riparian taxa, mostly poplar and willow, um, and more open woodland taxa like oak, uh, which you can see up there in orange. So again, we can look at this by time period for each of the sites. Um, at Tel Zedan, there's, there doesn't seem to be a huge uh, a difference in, in between the Ubaid and LC1 periods in terms of the overall composition of fuel. I'll get into some of the dendrological uh, data uh, in just a minute, which I think shows um, some more interesting uh, differences over time. At Surasia, um, however, we do seem to see um, an increase in the use of oak over time. But again, I caution you that, that the numbers, uh, the counts uh, from Surasia are so low that I hesitate to place too much meaning, especially given how many indeterminate uh, fragments there are. And then again, looking at this by context, um, one couple things that I found interesting uh, for Tel Zedan um, 
looking at the pyrotechnic features, which you see there, that's um, samples primarily coming from Operation 8 versus the hearths and ovens, which are samples primarily coming from Operations 11, 14, those domestic contexts. You do see a couple slight differences. Um, so there's a greater use of um, sort of xerophilic shrubs, like kinopodiaceous shrubs um, in the pyrotechnic features. While you see uh, the occasional um, open parkland, uh, mostly oak or uh, rosaceous, like um, a, a pear or something like that, uh, present in the, in the hearths and ovens instead. But here's where the, um, the wood charcoal data uh, gets really interesting. Um, so I did a dendrological analysis on the uh, fragments of wood from Telze Don. I did not do it on, on Serasia again because the sample numbers were so low. Uh, but um, looking at a variety of different uh, dendrological features, I was able to uh, tease out some potential um, evidence for um, fuel selection, but both between the areas, uh, the, uh, domestic and industrial areas, but also changes over time. So across the wood charcoal assemblage from um, Zaydan, I found fungal hi-fi in about 40% of, uh, of the fragments from each uh, phase and from each uh, context type. Um, so it appears that people are largely relying on um, uh, the collection of fallen wood. They're not cutting down trees so much um, uh, to satisfy their, their wood requirements. It makes sense, you know, this is, this is prior to um, uh, the widespread use of metal axes, right? So, so cutting down trees is a bit more work. If there's plenty of fallen branches and rotten branches, um, then perhaps those are, are preferred more than fresh cut wood. When we look at um, the ring curvature data, so uh, how curved uh, uh, the, the rings are on each fragment, um, we do see a change over time from the Ubeid uh, fragments uh, to the LC1 fragments with an increase um, in weakly curved uh, fragments, which suggests that there's an increase in the presence of um, of, uh, of large branches, right? So we might be seeing, uh, we could potentially argue that this is um, an intensification over time of wood collection. Maybe there are fewer smaller branches available. Maybe they're integrating more uh, fresh cut wood at this point. Um, we see specifically uh, for the tamarisk data, I looked at the difference between um, ring curvature data for um, the pyrotechnic or the industrial features from Operation 8 uh, and the domestic uh, hearths and ovens uh, from 11 and 14. And what I found was there's actually quite a bit of difference in branch size between uh, these two areas with a preference for smaller branches in the pyrotechnic features um, and larger branches at, in the hearths. Now this could come down to a variety of both taphonomic uh, and preference related uh, reasonings. It, it could simply be that the higher temperatures in the kiln destroyed more of the outer layer of the larger branches, leaving uh, the uh, strong ring curvature um, specimens overrepresented. Um, or it could be a preference for fast burning, quick burning things in the pyrotechnic features versus long, steady burning. Uh, 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 logs in the hearths and ovens. Um, and then finally, um, I looked at, uh, I, I, I created an index of vitrification um, to look at differences between the two um, sites. And you see an increase in highly vitri or moderately or highly vitrified fragments of wood. The anatomical features become sort of um, melted together um, due to high temperature. Um, but there's a higher proportion of uh, both that vitrification to some moderate vitrification and high vitrification, vitrification degree three um, in the pyrotechnic features. Okay, so the third data type 
that I employed in this analysis was this geoarchaeological study of um, sediment subsamples looking for those dung spherulites and ash pseudomorphs. Um, so the figure that I've presented here uh, is divided into columns. The first is dung spherulites on the left and number A or letter A. In the middle, we have calcitic ash pseudomorphs. And on the right, I included the ratio of seeds to wood, uh, which is commonly used by archaeobotanists as a proxy for dung to wood fuel use. And I was really interested in seeing um, how these different data types lined up. Um, so the three, um, the three figures on the top uh, are uh, uh, the data broken down by archaeological period, with gray uh, being Serasia and blue being uh, Tel Zedan. And the bottom is the same data, but presented according to context um, rather than period. Um, and I think from this data set that this largely confirms sort of what, what we've seen in the, the wood and macrobotanical data so far, which is that there's clear differences between the two sites. Um, and that over time, the differences are a little bit more ambiguous. The changes within each site are a little bit more ambiguous. Um, from the perspective of the dung spherulites in column A, we really do see a massive amount of dung spherulites uh, from the site of Serasia. And this makes sense if you think back to that macrobotanical data. There were a lot of wild and weedy um, species there. Um, and then from the wood charcoal data, there wasn't much in the way of wood. So it makes sense that this site, at this site, they seem to be relying quite heavily on dung fuel use. Um, if we look at column B, uh, we see the opposite pattern. At Tel Zedan, there's quite a bit more of these calcitic ash pseudomorphs, um, which represent uh, calcium oxalate crystals from within plant tissues that have burned, right? So that provides you more evidence for uh, wood as compared uh, to the spherulites. Um, and then when we look at it in comparison to the uh, seed to wood ratio, we see basically the same pattern, right? So you see um, a much higher proportion of seeds at the, uh, uh, within Serasia and, a, uh, and a, a much more, uh, the ratio skews much more towards wood uh, for Tel Zedan. Now there were, um, <clears throat> there were a couple interesting things um, that I, I just want to point out here, um, the seed to wood ratio uh, for the pyrotechnic features uh, versus hearths and ovens for Tel Zedan seems to suggest that maybe wood wasn't as important as a component um, for the pyrotechnic features as it was for the hearths and ovens. Um, so that might be getting, getting again at, at, at perhaps some um, fuel selection. We'll touch on that more in just a moment. Um, and then finally, just to pull all of this data together, um, I performed a, a canonical correspondence analysis of presence absence data for both the um, wood charcoal and macrobotanical data. Um, you can see all of the individual taxa uh, plotted on the biplot on the left. Um, and then this is constrained, uh, a canonical correspondence analysis is a, a constrained organ, ordination technique um, by uh, so-called environmental variables or variables that you, you already understand about the structure of the data. And, and I've assumed here that the abundance of dung spherulites is a proxy for the use of dung. Um, the abundance of ash pseudomorphs or the uh, weight of wood is a proxy for the use of wood. And, um, as you can see from the, the biplot on uh, the biplots uh, uh, in this figure, um, these uh, data points really uh, are, are, are these trends really strongly uh, move in the direction of the different sites. You can see the sites on the left and right. This is SR for Serasia and ZD for Tel Zedan. Um, so this looks like a complicated figure, uh, but it's, it's really a, a quite intuitive way to interpret the archaeobotanical record. Um, it places uh, samples that are more similar to each other, closer to each other, um, and then taxa that occur in 
uh, samples together more closely to each other, right? So um, all of the taxa that you see skewing towards the triangle for Serasia suggest uh, items that are most commonly found or more commonly found within Serasia, while the other ones um, are more commonly found at Zedan. Um, so this is basically, uh, I think, just an, uh, uh, an interesting way to show that these trends seem to be real when we look at it for a variety of different ways. We, we're seeing fundamentally, fuel, fundamentally different field use regimes between the two sites. Um, the relationship between the sites and the time periods isn't quite as strong in the data, right? It, it, it tends to go with where the, the, the samples are more frequent. There are more LC1 samples with Serasia, more obeyed samples with uh, Zaydan. Um, but uh, interestingly, you see again, um, the wood taxa skew nicely towards Zaydan. Those are those gray squares. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, wild and weedy taxa uh, that are indicative of steppic environments or, or, or might have been included in grazing, things that, that might be tasty to animals, um, really do skew close to uh, Surasia and that, that arrow pointing to the increasing amount of dung spherulites. Um, so just to sort of sum up everything and, and draw us here to a close, at Surasia, uh, what we see is really a, 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 a fuel economy that's heavily centered on agropastoralism, right? There's very little wood fuel present. It is present, but it's, it, it's not nearly as abundant as the evidence for dung fuel um, and to a lesser degree um, for that cereal chaff, which may have been mixed in with the dung or burned separately. Um, and this brings up, I think, an interesting question. Um, Despite, uh, you know, I presented that map earlier about potential vegetation, we really don't actually know a whole lot about what the vegetation looked like on the Erbil Plain prior to um, widespread urbanism and intensive agriculture in, in the region. Um, it is interesting to me. Interesting to me, I would have expected there to be a little bit more uh, wood in this data set than in the Tel Zaydan data set because Serasia typically receives considerably more rainfall, certainly enough to support an open oak woodland um, absent any other um, human intervention or, or other factors. So it's, inter it's interesting, and, and I don't really have an answer for why we don't see more wood at this, at this site. For Tel Zaydan, what we see is really a more balanced um, uh, 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 fuel uh, regime that's mixing together d some dung fuel, um, a greater proportion of wood charcoal. Um, and you, we remember we had that ma those massive quantities uh, of chaff. Now, when we look within the site, we also saw a couple different, uh, a couple differences, which I think perhaps uh, speak to possible functional differences in, in fuel selection, fuel being selected for specific purposes. So within the pyrotechnic features in Operation 8, we saw smaller branches of, uh, uh, of tamarisk present. We saw um, uh, lower counts of spherulites, um, but also lower counts of ash pseudomorphs. Um, the work on phytoliths done by Tom Hart, um, which was presented uh, both in, in his dissertation um, and in the uh, article that we co wrote and co wrote in 2019, showed that there were abundant grass phytoliths in the pyrotechnic features. And that's backed up again by, by the large quantity of cereal chaff that we found them. So it might be that they're really uh, preferencing quick burning, high flame fuels in these pyrotechnic. Uh, kilns, um, possibly as a means of modulating the, the burning environment um, to achieve specific, um, um, the specific uh, burning characteristics or heating characteristics for different styles of, of ceramics or, or, or whatever they're, they're producing there. Um, 
In the meantime, at the domestic um, um, hearths and kilns in Operation 11 and 14, there were a greater number of uh, dung spherulites, and you have slightly larger uh, uh, pieces of wood. So it might be suggesting instead there that they're having a preference for, um, for more steady, slowly burning uh, fuels um, that can stay lit uh, for longer periods of time. So uh, dung cakes are actually a really steady, um, moderate heat. They're great for cooking bread and, and other things with, um, and again, large, large pieces of wood would serve a, a similar function. Um, so just to start to draw things to a, a, a close, um, this study has, I think, shown really clear differences in and, and fuel acquisition strategies between the sites, um, despite evidence for all of the same types of fuel at each of the site, right? We had um, riparian wood, we had dung, we had agricultural waste at um, each of the sites, um, and yet in different proportions, and, and you know, at least in the situation for Telse Don, um, uh, you see differences within the site uh, in terms of uh, fuel use. Um, so this, brings the question as to why, 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 why do we see these patterns and why are they different between um, the two sites? One thing that I think this uh, study has demonstrated um, is that Ubayid and Lake Calcolithic I peoples in Northern Mesopotamia um, really relied on a, a very integrated agro-pastoral economy that extended not just to food production or, or to other secondary products, but to fuel as well. Um, agricultural wastes such as chaff, as well as dung, seems to form this almost cyclical economy, right? It's produced as a, a result of those economic activities. It's reused as fuel. Um, and then potentially it may have been uh, the ash uh, from these burning episodes was mixed with manure and thrown back out on the fields to produce more crops and more uh, fodder for animals. So uh, I, I think it, in the future, it will be interesting to really try to tease apart the relationship between agro-pastoralism and fuel use in semi-arid environments like this in a little bit more detail. Um, it also brings us, uh, us to the question of the relation between the environment um, and fuel use. Um, <clears throat> based on um, other studies focused on the early Bronze Age. Well, we know that um, during the Calcolithic, at least in Syria, um, we don't have a, a whole lot of evidence for environmental degradation until much later, right? The, the vegetation really strongly uh, starts to change by the late Bronze Age and, and definitely by the Iron Age and into the historical periods. Um, we have a lot less information on that for uh, the Erbil Plain um, so Surasia uh, being one of the first um, sites to produce archaeobotanical data on the Erbil Plain will be really important uh, as a baseline data set for understanding uh, that sort of vegetation history. Um, <clears throat> so just to close out, uh, I, I want to leave you just with a couple thoughts on what I think the potential of is of this anal of these analyses. This is really, I think, a, a starting point for me rather than an ending point. Um, I think that we need to really grow our, our data set on uh, Ubayid and, and early late Calcolithic uh, um, archaebotanical data in, in, in general, but specifically fuel related data. Um, but I really do, I, I, I hope this has shown that fuel-centered analyses can really um, provide us with some important information about um, uh, fuel economies in general, but also you know, the potential for human impacts on the local vegetation. We're seeing um, during the Calcolithic, a, a very sustainable use of resources, right? Drawing not just on the natural resources, the wood available, but also uh, drawing on waste products, right? Uh, and what we see in the later Bronze and Iron Ages uh, is the end of sustainability in a lot of ways, the progressive depletion 
of, uh, of forests across northern Mesopotamia and, and eventually across most of, the, uh, of Southwest Asia, um, due in large part to people's in, uh, insatiable need for fuel, both for metal uh, working, but also just daily height, um, uh, heating needs. Um, one thing that I'd like to explore uh, uh, in more detail, in which we sort of got a preview from, from Tel Zedan, uh, is uh, the potential to investigate sort of intrasite questions uh, about social and economic organization. So we seem to maybe have some evidence here from Zaydan for specialization of fuel use between uh, craft production and domestic activities. Um, Surasia, having only those uh, domestic contexts to draw upon, uh, we don't really have the opportunity yet um, to investigate sort of those, those questions, but that's rapidly changing. The excavations at Suraja are ongoing. Um, like I, I said before, um, we have an interesting large non-domestic structure uh, in operations nine and 10, uh, which um, my preliminary looks at, at the fuel information has shown a, a potentially a quite a different pattern uh, than what we saw in the domestic context. Um, so uh, the, the, the potential is really there for Surasia in particular um, in the future to really expand our, our understanding of uh, calcolithic fuel use. Unfortunately, Tel Zedan is um, no longer accessible because of the, the current conflicts and um, instability within Syria. Um, so with that, I'd like to draw to a close. Um, I, I'd first just like to uh, uh, thank um, the uh, National Science Foundation um, and the Yukon Department of Anthropology for funding um, this research. Um, I'd especially like to thank uh, the Airfield Department of uh, Antiquities um, and the Rocket Museum who uh, gener generously uh, allowed the samples um, from these two sites uh, to be exported uh, to the US for analysis. Um, like I said at the beginning of this talk that this data uh, was uh, formed a part of my dissertation. Um, so I'd like to thank my dissertation committee, uh, especially Alexia Smith and Gil Stein um, uh, for um, shepherding me through this research uh, and for giving me access for, to this data uh, to work on. Um, and then finally, I'd like to just thank the, uh, the wonderful uh, Chicago team that excavated both of these sites uh, for doing just a, such a fantastic job on these excavations and, and really making my life easy uh, as a specialist analyze, analyzing data after the fact. Um, and then I had uh, help in processing a lot of this data uh, from several uh, undergraduate lab volunteers. Um, so in conclusion, uh, I'd just again like to thank uh, Arwa uh, for inviting me to give this lecture, um, and I'd be delighted to take any questions.